Derek, thanks for joining us on eCancer TV. Give us your quick uh, CV. Quick CV, De Derek Stewart. I was a throat cancer patient back in 1995. I then got involved in a whole variety of uh, patient voice being expressed in cancer research and cancer services, and at one point was chair of the consumer group in cancer research. So you moved from being a patient to a consumer. Uh, what were you consuming after having well, been the patient? The interesting thing is we use the term consumer in research because when you're being treated, uh, you don't get much choice. But one of the things you do have choice in, so it's far more like a customer, is in research because it's the one thing you're asked for your informed consent on. So in that respect, we still use the word consumer, certainly in cancer research. But if you were to look in other areas like mental health, they would describe themselves as service users. The titles don't really matter. What's crucial is that sense of partnership, working together and finding solutions to different diseases, and in our case, cancer, and how we can do something about so, it. So who do you work with? You're, you're a, 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 an ex-patient who said uh, cancer of the larynx, I suppose. Yes. Uh, who do you work with? What's this, what, who are the other people in your team? Well, what are you trying to do? The Consumer Liaison Group is a sort of national voice for patients in the UK and it enables patients to get involved in working with researchers. So if a researcher wants an idea and thinks, you know, would, would this actually run with patients? So in other words, could we recruit to the trial? But actually it's the study design in a way that, that sounds good enough. So is the information leaflet looking good enough? Would it attract patients? And sometimes it's about sitting on a trial management group to give that external perspective, lay voice, or sometimes, if you like, customer feedback. You gave a spectacular talk yesterday at the opening of the National Cancer Research Institute uh, here in Liverpool. And uh, you, were, you were talking about, um, about trials and, and, and the difficulties of, uh, of getting the patient's voice heard at the at the, the, the design stage and at the monitoring stage and then presumably also at the analysis stage. Um, you, you, NCRI are, are, are now into every clinical trial in the UK? Sorry? Are you saying that the patient is now involved in every no. trial in the UK or just, how many trials are we talking about here? I think there are a number of trials. There are an increasing number of trials in which patients are now involved. It's incredibly difficult to give a number because although we tick a little box that says, have you got patient and public involvement? Mm. That may just have been going along to talk to a focus group or a self-help and spoker. So getting the, the data, raw data, is very difficult. Um, however, we would say there are hundreds upon hundreds of trials. But it's not about putting somebody onto the committee or being there. It's about purpose, impact and benefit. What is the purpose? Why do we need to get that insight and how might it help us and how can we measure the impact and whether it's a benefit. So if I give you an example that if we run a trial or if the, you, the, the clinicians or researchers, want to run a trial and it fails to recruit, then we've wasted a huge amount sure. of public money right, that's been put in by the funders. So it's really important that we make sure that trial is of the highest quality and often you will say that that's about the scientific quality. But if that scientific quality is the good, but the question it's asking is fundamentally wrong for the patient community, then it won't recruit properly. So it's about getting those voices in, but making sure it's targeted. So it's not about putting somebody onto every committee, every trial. It's about, is it appropriate? Is it going to cause benefit? And can we just measure and gather the story of how it's changed things? So a prostate cancer, prostate cancer recently went from 40% recruitment to 70% because they re-looked at the information leaflets and said, actually, this doesn't sort of ring true mm -hmm. to us as patients. Sure. I mean, we're catching up with the Americans who've been doing this for a long time. Um, what the Americans have been c complaining about lately is uh, a decline in recruitment to clinical trials. Um, I heard that the, in Brussels, the European Commission uh, admitting that overall clinical trials recruitment is down in the whole of Europe. Um, are you fighting a rearguard action? I think we, we're doing very, very well in the UK and certainly the trials that the National Cancer Research Network 
because 10 years ago, I think it was 4% of cancer patients going in, and I think that's increased to 18%. So we're doing fairly well here. 18% 18. 18 now of patients going on to trials. So we've seen a massive recruitment. And of course, we have the overarching body, certainly in England, of the National Institute for Health Research, which again is making sure that some of the infrastructure is in place to put the funding there. So I think we're we're not in a rosy place, we're not in a wonderful place, but I think we are fighting a rear guard action. But the patient movement is interesting because I think it is saying we do want to take part in trials or at least have the opportunity to find out about trials. The biggest complaint is patients are not told about trials that are relevant to them and they don't know how to find out where to go. And yet it is a pledge certainly in the NHS constitution for England. Sure. So I was going to ask you exactly that. I've, uh, I've got a, a, a friend with uh, cancer. How do I find out um, a suitable trial? They come to me because I'm the only oncologist they know. And how do they do that? I work in Milan. I don't know how you find a, a clinical uh, trial in the UK. OK, there's a, a, a new, there's work behind the scenes. There will be a new UK trials gateway that will help people be able to go on. Certainly through organizations like Cancer Research, uh, Research UK, they have a very, very good database. So if there was somebody watching and says, I'd like to find out a good trial, that would be a number one place for me to go at this present time. And I think we'll see that more joined up. The great thing about uh, what CIUK have done is that they've actually put lay summaries. So it's in language that I would understand rather than a three-armed randomized control trial with a name that's been made up of acronyms. You know? sure, 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 sure. I think that's very interesting, and particularly the contrast uh, in, in, the, in the uptake of, uh, of trials by patients in the UK compared to mainland Europe or, uh, or the States. Do you think this, is, this has been driven by the patients, or are there other factors? Funding help, <coughs> or is the bureaucracy less? Right. Uh, I think in the UK, we're very lucky. The National Cancer Research Institute, established sort of 10 years, almost 10 years ago, has brought the partners together in a way that I think the whole world is looking at because it's looking at our all, whole all overall structure. But certainly NCRI is leading the field in that area. So the partners are looking at having a strategic review. So there's a sense of knowing what research needs to be done. And of course that's backed up with the National Cancer Research Network which is enabling all those trials to take place. And if, yes, you're right, it is a background against the background of political support for research and science in this country, which helps us keep bright and sparkling minds, but it also means that for patients, so as patients we are pushing, uh, I, I hesitate to say from the bottom, so I don't think it's like that anymore, but we are pushing from one side, we've got government pushing from another, and actually we've got the research community and scientists saying, actually we need to be doing this together. And I think that's what makes this conference quite unique and earlier on you said America has patients. They've often got patient advocates who are sometimes on the outside and I think we are very firmly on the inside and part of the whole. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, it's, a, it's very important that, that patients get clarity of, uh, of, of where to start their journey and their journey starts with information. Mm -hmm. um, I'm involved with eCancer TV and, and the European Institute in Milan in a uh, a European Commission project called Eurocancercoms, and this is uh, set up to develop essentially an NCI.gov or a clinicaltrials.gov for Europe. Yeah. Because more and more, of course, um, we are seeing patients you know, crossing borders in, within the European community to get treatments that they can't mm -hmm. get in one country. I mean, the UK has uh, had, a, had, a, had a problem with, uh, with access to, uh, to, to a number of drugs for cancer which have been available uh, in my institute in, in, in Italy, and people have been um, actually physically moving with their feet, which is a, you know, an awful uh, state to be in. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so I think that you know, other people are, are reaching this and it would be very important to take the cancer help model and take it out. Um, but just another line really, and that is if I'm a patient and I've had an experience in my cancer journey and I think now that's something that really needs to be sorted. And, and I have an idea that of, of an area of uncertainty. I come across uncertainty. Uncertainty is where a clinical trial question starts. Who do I tell? Okay, there, um, 
if, if I was to be a patient and, and had a problem and I saw there was an, an issue and wondered, is there anybody looking at this, right? Every, uh, certainly most cancer networks throughout the country have some sort of patient group attached. You could go along there and say, is anybody looking? Most of those groups, and that's in services, are tied in with research. And that's something we're doing more and more. So they could take that issue. There are groups like something I've called the James Lind Alliance, who do a wonderful role in terms of priority setting, in which they get everybody together and they get the patient groups and they have them in a separate room from the professionals say, what are the issues for you? What are the unanswered questions there? And what are the unanswered questions for the other group? And then they bring them together and see where they match and where there are areas of, of contention. And it's then up to the group to then say, well, we should actually be looking at those issues of contention as well as the ones that we normally do. So I think there's a, so two uh, tracks. One is go along to a local group and start to ask those questions. But if you don't get any joy, there is a National Consumer Liaison Group. It is on the NCRI website. If you go through there, you'll get in contact with them and we can invoice some of those issues. And then, of course, there are all of the different charities that work through the NCRI that can be another good source of going and uh, raising things. I was once fortunate to be the international observer at the, uh, the same process happening on a national basis in the States, except it wasn't just patients and scientists and doctors talking about research priorities, it was talking about funding priorities and talking about research and supportive care and palliative care and um, uh, all, all the whole gamut mm -hmm. of what a, 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 a broad based um, uh, charity would be, would be looking at. Um, it, has that been done in the UK? And if so, what was the result? What do, what do, the, what do cancer patients, by their millions, mm -hmm. vote for? I think, uh, to begin with, when patients got involved, I believe that there was a view from the scientific community that we would all want to see issues of living, about living with cancer and the psychosocial aspects. And yes, those are very vitally important. What's interested, I think, everybody is that the patients are showing a great interest in the science as well as it's not one or the other. So we've had a number of initiatives certainly here in the UK. One of them were the supportive and palliative care uh, initiatives and collaboratives that looked at bringing those communities that look at the issues that matter for patients. And they have just come to an end and there has been a new rapid review of research into living with and beyond cancer as well as that sort of difficult stage of the end of life care. And that rapid review is gathering together, has gathered together a lot of the research and then starting to look at that. And I would say the shift in the last 10 years has been mainly from NCI being just about the science to being about the whole journey for the patient. And that's the journey rather than the clinical pathway and it takes account of those needs. So I think there's more of a, an opportunity for research in those areas. And of course, with the research, hopefully what follows is better service delivery. Yeah. You might be interested to know that the top of the league table on the voting uh, in the American uh, system was cancer research. Uh, this uh, NCRI rapid review uh, has come up with, with some, some priority statements. The, the, the rapid review into uh, what, it, what is uh, called survivorship and end-of-life care, but, uh, but as a patient, I prefer to as, as living with and beyond cancer. The rapid review was a, a very interesting model of how we review cancer research in this country. Um, it involved um, the uh, chairman bringing in the patient groups and then hearing from the scientists and those researchers in that area, as well as then the funders. And what it's done is come up with sort of various recommendations as, as what might be priorities and what we should be looking for in research in that area, which is about that living with and beyond cancer. And we actually need to know some more about that. We've roughly calculated there's about two million people like myself living with and beyond cancer, but there may be maybe more and there will be more in the next few years. So the more we understand what their needs are, both in terms of the living with, but what could be the possible after effects. Now, one of the speakers at the conference here at the National Cancer Research Institute was Patricia Gans, Professor Gans, and she was saying that every patient finishing their 
standard treatment. At the end of that should be given a care plan that says, well, here's what we've done to you and here's what we think might be happening next and here's what you should begin to look at. And I think patients would really welcome that sort of knowledge because many of them, when you finish treatment, it just feels as if suddenly everything's come to an end sure. because you've had all of that great support and then suddenly there's a vacuum. Mm. So I think to have something on bare paper that could carry forward and I hope the rapid review will so you get researchers looking at things like that. I thought Patricia Gans was, off, was good too and she was saying that uh, that's what's interesting in this business of what is there after the treatment is this void um, and, and there, there is nobody to, to support anymore and particularly the medical oncology and the surgical oncology group have essentially done their bit yes. and washed their hands and she was uh, lamenting uh, the lack of the general practitioner in the multidisciplinary team and the lack of communication throughout the whole process of treatment with the general practitioner who knows the patient or is supposed to know the patient best and therefore the general practitioner is, uh, is, is left with a discharge note and, and that's it. And, and at least gets a discharge note, which the patient doesn't get. So the patient should be getting, uh, a, 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 this is your care path from now on. Mm -hmm. The GP should get the same information and should know what the possible uh, sequelae, the longer term uh, uh, damage that some of the treatment might have given. Not the, it's not a common issue, but it can be a common issue. And Patricia Gans, I thought, was making a very good point about the, the, the fact that the patients who have had cancer are at high risk of getting a second cancer. Not a metastasis, well that can happen mm -hmm. too sadly, but a second cancer. Mm -hmm. And we are not taking the opportunity we should do as carers um, to re-educate, uh, to, to promote good health, uh, exercise, uh, good diet, uh, keeping your weight down, uh, keeping off the cigarettes and, and the alcohol, etc. Uh, I thought that was very appropriate to the NHS, although that was coming from Los Angeles. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the, when you finish treatment, you, you are just sent away and, and, and we just don't talk to our GPs. Yeah. If it wasn't for the fact that uh, despite the damaged voice, I have a voice, I just went and explained to my GP what had happened and what, you know, what treatments I'd been through. But our GPs are, I th I th they're just treated shabbily in this. You yeah. know, they make the referral, uh, then we're taken into secondary care were dealt with by our oncologists and I was dealt with very, very well. I've got no criticisms. They did a fabulous job. But but actually, I then come back and I live with. So I live with, for my sake, swallowing. You uh, live without. And, uh, without, and no <laughs> saliva glands. But nobody gave me any advice yeah. on that or support. It was left to me to go to our local support group. Um, and I just think we could be much, much better at tying up that after care and support for patients. But we need to involve our GPs. Sure. They just don't know enough about cancer and they're not given. And if, if what we read is true, that we will see more people living with and beyond cancer, yeah. then the GPs and, and nurses and district nurses, and I think the key group will be care workers. Because many people, if it's to be a disease of the elderly, as it is for a lot, then there's going to be lots of people in care homes with possibly chemotherapy being delivered in that home. So we've got to do an awful lot more engaging the whole health community in supporting cancer. How do we tackle that? Knock on the door of the Royal College of General Practitioners? I think there is a bit about knocking on the door of the Royal uh, College of Practitioners, uh, but I think there's also about talking to GPs. And if GPs have to take more of our role, in commissioning, certainly in England, but also in Scotland, you look between health and social care as they do in Wales. I think we've got to do more about engaging local communities. This is going to be a huge issue in the future. Now, I say issue in a, as if it's a, a terrible problem mm. because the science is making the treatments better, but there just will be more of it. So how do we just make sure those people are engaged? Sure. Derek, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, thank you.